have actually uh, been working in or with the Dominican Republic since uh, the 1970s. And during the 1980s, I spent a lot of time there. I was there on a regular basis. And I, I was involved in training students and, uh, and <clears throat> other things. And uh, I, I became very attached to the country. Um, and, and then in the 1990s, for a variety of reasons, I sort of uh, shifted uh, in other directions and uh, the Dominican Republic kind of fell off my radar screen. In, uh, in the mid-90s, when I started to uh, begin this project of assessing the business environments in Latin America, uh, all of a sudden I rediscovered the Dominican Republic, and it turns out the Dominican Republic is one of the stars in Latin America, along with countries like Chile and Mexico. And so I've come back to take a look at it in recent years. Uh, I didn't get back uh, very often, but I did go back uh, last, uh, uh, last spring uh, at the invitation of the State Department to do a speaking program on the DR-CAFTA, which is the free trade agreement between the United States and the Dominican Republic and five Central American countries. Um, two things have happened in the Dominican Republic in recent years that have uh, sort of uh, created new interest in the country. One, unfortunately, uh, was a negative uh, development. In uh, 2002 and 2003, there was a ma major banking crisis that actually was triggered by the collapse of a, of a huge bank and a government bailout that cost uh, billions of dollars. And the Dominican Republic doesn't throw around billions of dollars very easily. And as you'll see in some of the data I'm going to present you, this has had a, an impact. So I was interested in the extent to which the Dominican Republic had recovered from that when I went back last spring. And I was interested also in um, the impact and the response to dr -CAF to this new trade agreement. What I'm going to do here is, is, is set the Dominican Republic in a larger context of Latin America. And uh, in that regard, uh, Ambassador Frechette's already laid out uh, the fact that Latin America is in the midst of a a, a pretty dynamic business cycle now. Um, it's uh, had uh, five years of growth, which is actually the longest uh, sustained growth in 25 years. Uh, and along with that, low inflation, which is also a significant accomplishment, as you see up here. This growth has uh, initially been propelled by uh, rising exports. Uh, and very favorable terms of trade. He's also mentioned the boom in global commodity prices, uh, which is a large part of this story. Uh, but it's also been um, sustained by very liquid capital markets, global capital markets now. There's a lot of investment capital flowing into Latin America for a, a variety of reasons that I'll talk about in a moment and also in recent years by expanding domestic consumption. That is, Latin Americans have more income and they're spending that income and that's growing their economies now. If you look at consumer spending as a percent of income, it's increased dramatically. And this has to do with rising wages, rising employment, and, and also declining poverty. And, and those are not insignificant accomplishments. Uh, as I, and in addition, as he pointed out uh, properly, uh, this economic uh, boom, this economic cycle is associated with a series of economic policies that were adopted in, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, sometimes called the Washington Consensus, sometimes called uh, neoliberalism, I like to call it the new economic model. The new economic model has sort of two components. One is uh, macroeconomic policies designed to stabilize the economy, to stabilize exchange rates, to bring down inflation and fiscal spending. And a series of structural policies designed to open the economy to trade, investment, and um, taking the state out of the economy. So, and, and as I suggested, the, the important payoff has, has become clear in the last couple years of this cycle, and in that fact, poverty rates are going down. So 
pretty much throughout the region, but certainly in some countries more than others. Uh, <clears throat> employment is going up, particularly in the formal sector, which is where the good jobs are. And um, there is even uh, declining inequality, which has been a huge issue in Latin America. The clouds on the horizon now are clouds that are well known to us in this country because we're looking at them sort of on a daily basis. There is the uncertainty in global financial markets, which is linked to the subprime crisis in the United States. Um, <clears throat> stock markets bounce up and down. A couple weeks ago, the Asian market fell. I think we had a holiday, and so we were spared that. And then, you know, you, as soon as you think it's going in the toilet, they bounce up. So there's a lot of volatility in global financial markets, which means that investors are getting increasingly wary of taking risks. And that presumably would spill over into uh, emerging markets like Latin America because those are presumably more risky to begin with. A second uh, major concern this year that's growing, I think it just grew more yesterday, is the possibility of recession in the US economy. The United States is by far the most important trading partner of Latin America. It's also the source of not only trade, but it's a source of investment, and it's a source of tourism. And tourists are very important to many countries in the region, particularly the Dominican Republic. The other thing that's appearing on the horizon in Latin America is, the, uh, is inflation. Inflation's kind of jumping up, bumping up uh, in all, in, in most countries, and so that's of concern now because it looked as though inflation was pretty much under control. In general, though, the outlook is still pretty good. We expect another year of reasonably good growth and uh, reasonably low inflation, and then probably into the next year. But it's less certain than it was. Now, within Latin America, there are significant differences. Um, think Chile, think Venezuela. Chile is sort of the, is the uh, star of Latin America in economic development and economic policy reform and political stability. Um, it is the sort of uh, Latin American tiger, if you will. I, I like to think of uh, Chile as sort of the Latin American Spain. Chile looks like Spain did 20 years ago, and maybe in 20 years, Chile will be a developed, a fairly uh, modern country, the way Spain is today. And Venezuela is sort of the other side of this in terms of uh, some things, but not others. But I'm not going to talk about any one of these countries. I'm going to talk about the Dominican Republic. How does it stack up in Latin America? And, and my argument is it looks pretty good, has looked pretty good, but there are some concerns. So let's look at some of the indicators and measures of economic uh, performance. And what I have here is the growth rates, GDP growth uh, over the last 10 years for Latin America, which is the dark bar, and for the Dominican Republic, which is the light bar. And what you see is you see this growth cycle, which began in mid 2003 in Latin America here, following a downturn associated with a series of things. And then you see the Dominican Republic. And what you see in the Dominican Republic is the Dominican Republic has had the highest rates of growth in Latin America over the last 10 years. It grew last year at over 10%, which is Chinese rates, basically. And it's growing very high. And in fact, if you look at the 10-year average, including the dip, it is at 5.3%, which is the highest of any uh, of the 18 Latin American countries which I cover. And those are all the major economies. Here we're talking about the Venezuelas and the Argentinas and the Chiles. And it's kind of surprising. I don't think people would have expected that. I didn't. And uh, I think in part it's because the Dominican Republic is a relatively small country. It's only 9 million people, and also because it's in the Caribbean and not in, in sort of mainland Central America or uh, South America, perhaps. So it's, it's a little bit of an outlier. 
Uh, then we have the inflation picture. And here we also see uh, inflation really, this picture is kind of incomplete because if you would, were to go back to 1994, Latin American inflation rates, and here it's the average inflation rate for the region as a whole, uh, was up here somewhere. It, it dropped down dramatically and it stayed down popping up in 2002, 2003, below 10%. And as I said, there's some fear that it's going to pop up again this year, but still at historically low rates. The Dominican Republic doesn't look quite as good, and you see the impact of the collapse of the economy because of the banking crisis. And this is the thing that I was interested in seeing whether there's been a recovery from that or not. And uh, you know the short answer is yes, there has been a recovery from it. And what's and, and I, I would argue that and that recovery's been pretty impressive. The Dominican Republic got very high rates, got very low growth rates, negative growth. It got very high rates of inflation. Here you see at one point inflation was 42 percent, and it had and its currency collapsed as well. The Dominican peso lost a huge amount of value vis-a-vis -vis hard currency. And, and the people in the Dominican Republic suffered under that. That was a serious problem. Now, we talked about how this um, ec current economic boom is being uh, driven by exports. And as Ambassador Frechette pointed out, it's kind of surprising because Latin America has always been considered to be burdened as an export of primary products of uh, oil, we know well, of coffee, sugar, tin, copper. And the uh, conventional economic wisdom is that Latin American countries ought to move toward a more manufactured export platform. But now those Latin American countries that have uh, uh, these commodities are doing very well, thank you. Uh, the Dominican Republic is not one of those countries. And so now we see a country that has a more traditional, uh, has moved toward a uh, uh, export diversification, non-traditional exports. In the case of the Dominican Republic, we're talking about moving out of sugar, which was a major export, to uh, tourism and to uh, light manufacturing export processing zones. The Dominican Republic has grown its trade. This is uh, DR uh, exports, the dark graph, and DR imports, the lighter graph. And trade has grown. It's grown dramatically. But the Dominican Republic has consistently run a, a trade deficit and a current accounts deficit, which you don't, ideally you don't want to do that. But the Dominican Republic has shifted to these non-traditional, uh, cheap labor, labor intensive kinds of exports. And those compete against China and Asia. And that is a difficult competitive situation. So the Dominicans have felt kind of overwhelmed, and they're not alone in that. Uh, there are, I think, uh, you know, different ways of kind of getting out of this. Um, one of them being is you have to become more competitive. Another being, well, why don't you negotiate preferential access to markets? And in the case of the Dominican Republic, that would be the United States. And DR CAPTA gives the Dominican Republic preferential. It assures the Dominican Republic preferential access to U.S. markets, which means that Dominican textiles theoretically go in at a price advantage because of tariffs or not having tariffs vis-a-vis -vis Chinese or, ex or textiles from India or Bangladesh or other uh, powerhouses. The other problem that the Dominican Republic has is it imports its energy. It doesn't have currently anywhere near energy self-sufficiency. And we all know what that has meant in this economy. Well, you can imagine what it means in an economy that is, is where per capita income is, is $7,000 a year. So Dominican, the Dominican picture is, 
is mixed now. Uh, and the question to Dominicans is, how, how do we advance in this? And investors look at the Dominican Republic and they say, where are the good um, investments? Why? Here we see uh, foreign direct investment in the Dominican Republic over time. And here, the Dominican Republic, I think in, in per capita terms, has, has done relatively well. Uh, that is, it's been a magnet for foreign investment. Dominicans have benefited from that in terms of uh, increase of foreign direct investment. I went back and looked back into the 1990s and saw that there's this tremendous jump in 1993 in foreign investment in the Dominican Republic. And it's, it's pretty much stayed up. It dropped down during the crisis, but it's come up and, and looks pretty good. Latin America and the Dominican Republic have done well because they've adopted a good set of, of policies. And the policies that are associated on the macroeconomic side that economists argue are important are what are called the holy trinity. Inflation targeting using interest rates, something we're familiar with in the United States, and I think we may become more familiar with uh, shortly, where the Fed sets the rate to affect either to bring down inflation or increase growth. That's a tool now that is used widely throughout Latin America. Thick floating exchange rates, just to let the market determine what the exchange rate is, what, what you, how many dollars your pesos are worth, and uh, fiscal discipline. And let me say a few words about fiscal discipline because I think the Dominican Republic has done reasonably well there. The idea in fiscal discipline, the argument of economists is that you have to kind of stay with, the, you have to keep your fiscal deficit, if you have one, uh, below 2% of GDP. Uh, the United States would flunk right now. Uh, and really what you want to do is you want to have a fiscal surplus because you have, that's how you pay off your debts. You accumulate uh, these fiscal surpluses so you can pay off the debts. And, the, and Latin Americans and the Repu Dominican Republic have carried uh, fiscal, uh, have carried a fairly large debt burden for some significant period of time. Fiscal discipline also implies that you make choices about who, what you spend money on. Do we spend it on consumption or do we spend it on investment, do we invest in, say, subsidize fuel prices, or do we invest in the construction of roads? And then how do you, who pays for this? What's the tax structure look like? Uh, do, we connect, do we collect enough taxes or too much, and do we collect from the right people in the right way? In any case, if you look at this, you'll see that there are kind of two measures. One the, is the primary, uh, balance of the central government, and the primary balance is before debt payments, and the overall balance. And what you see is that Latin America has built up a primary surplus in recent years, in part because the economies are growing so well, and they have actually been able to build uh, up a second, a, an overall surplus. And, and that is a significant accomplishment in a region that had a, a long tradition of uh, fiscal deficits. The Dominican Republic has done reasonably well here as well, which was, has not been easy. It's a great, been a great controversy because it involved, involves hard choices about what do we spend money on. The other aspect of macroeconomic policy that's important, has been important in the in Latin America has been uh, management of, of foreign debt. And so there's been a lot of concern about that because default means investors lose money. If investors lose money and don't get paid back, they're not gonna invest. And if you wanna grow, you have to have investment. And in Latin America's case, because of domestic savings rates being so low, uh, foreign investment has been very important. So investors and the rating agencies like Standard & Poor's will look at a country's ability to pay its debt. One thing you, it's easy to look at is the debt getting bigger or is it getting smaller in absolute terms. And here we see the Dominican debt profile. This is the external debt. This is the money owed to the outside world. 
in 7.2 billion currently, roughly. You see it, it went up after the crisis of 2002, 2003, but it seems to be leveling off. The other thing you look at is the ability to pay that debt, the debt ratio, ratio to GDP or to exports. And here, Latin America and the Dominican Republic have been doing pretty well because exports have been growing so well. So the Dominican Republic is in, in reasonably good shape there. It's economic, uh, it looks economically responsible. My, my take on the Dominican Republic would see these kinds of strengths. There is this sustained growth over time, which is undeniable and which is pretty impressive by anybody's standards. You can't make money over time if, if things don't grow. So not only does the economy grow, but profits grow, incomes grow. It has all kinds of good effects. Second thing that impressed me was the recovery from the banking crisis. Third, it's a country that is uh, politically stable, has a functioning democracy about which my colleague will have more to say in a moment. And fourth, the Dominican Republic now is a member of a, a free trade agreement with the United States, DR-CAFTA. And I think that's important for the reasons that we've already sort of discussed. There are another couple things about DR-CAFTA that are important. One is DR-CAFTA, or these free trade agreements, require the signatory countries to be in compliance domestic law with a trade agreement. So you have to make changes in your domestic laws affecting the protection of intellectual property rights, a big concern. Uh, competition policy, uh, other kinds of things, opening for free investment national treatment of investors, national tr treatment of, uh, of uh, public bidding on government contracts. So it's not just about trade, it's about this notion of upgrading the legal environment and the regulatory environment that, in, that investors theoretically are gonna feel good about, and if they feel good about it, then they're gonna take a second look at a country and invest in it. There are, there are concerns uh, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, it is a country in which uh, over 40% of the population lives below the poverty line. That's significant, and I don't think that's changed very much over time. It is a country with a certain amount of inequality characteristic of Latin America. It's not the worst, but it's, it's not good, and you don't have to be a, an economist to see that if you go to the Republic. You see the, the gap between the rich and the poor. It, it's there. And, and that, of course, uh, creates social unrest and, and some political tensions that uh, weaken the business environment in the, in the Dominican Republic. The second uh, fairly significant concern is weak rule of law. Uh, you can measure this in a variety of ways. One would be the perception of the prevalence of corruption. And uh, in the case of the Dominican Republic, uh, corrupt, the, the corruption indices issued by uh, Transparency International and other agencies suggest that corruption is quite high in the Dominican Republic and that uh, it takes a long time to get legal judgments. It's also a country of high bureau bureaucratic problems, of, of bureaucratic obstacles to running a business. And, and one final concern, the, the country has chronic power shortages. If you go to the American Republic, there are blackouts all the time, and this has been going on for over 20 years now, as far as I know. And every government says they're gonna deal with this problem. And I wish the ambassador was here to tell us that they're gonna deal with this problem. But it doesn't get dealt with. And you gotta wonder after a while if it is gonna be dealt with. And it's, it's a problem for business. It's a problem for people who live there. It's hot there. Food spoils, you can't run your fan. So, so that's a concern. What to watch? There's an election coming in May, and I'm sure Trudy will talk about this. Um, the U.S. recession, if it gets worse, would have a major impact on the Dominican Republic, not all in terms of 
U.S. imports from the DR, but also in terms of tourist visits to the DR from the United States. Inflation is, is a concern. And finally, uh, I think that the Dominican Republic has had, uh, is of a mixed mind about the DR CAFTA agreement. Uh, Dominicans had some real reservations about this trade agreement. Uh, and what I found was a kind of dragging of feet in to come into full compliance with it. And, and this, I think, was, was importantly the, uh, in the commercial class in the Dominican Republic has been reluctant. Because not only has, does DR CAFTA give uh, the Dominican Republic preferential access to our market, it gives us preferential access to their market. And that is where Dominicans, uh, Dominican, local Dominican industry has to compete with US imports. And the other part of this, which I found somewhat disturbing, is that Dominican consumers really haven't seen the benefit of this in terms of lower prices, which is what, theoretically, one of the benefits of a trade agreement. And, and the explanation I got was because the Dominican economy is not is not, a, is not a competitive economy. It's an oligopic economy, and so it's controlled. And, and that's why prices, that lower imports don't get turn, uh, passed on in terms of uh, lower consumer prices. So uh, Dominican Republic is an interesting country. Uh, it's, it's there, it's important. It's by far the most important economy in the Caribbean. And uh, I think the United States and U.S. investors uh, need to take a look at it. I, I hope that the Dominicans themselves take a look at some of these concerns. Thank you.